for me to write. I've been rewriting as I'm over there. Um, initially, the idea was to have a panel uh, for folks to talk about what we're going to do in, in a post-Macintosh world. I don't know if that term is really correct. Um, so I'm just going to riff off things, and I hope we have a discussion. Even though, So number one, it was hard to find people who were interested to sit up here and say this thing that we've kind of pinned our industry on, our farm on, isn't what it used to be. Um, but yet at the same time, I want to say it, it is what it used to be. It's the same apple. Um, it's just a different landscape. Um, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Um, probably going to ramble a little bit just because I don't have a script right now, but I've just been over there banging away on things. But what do we got? Oh, first thing, nobody mentioned my haircut. Or one person did. Are you right? Like somebody, right? So uh, just want to highlight, I raised five grand for UVM scholarship fund to do this. Um, and that's great. 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 Um, and that's my dean cutting my hair. So there's some politics that kind of helped out there. But it's not new. So you might have remembered me as an undergrad. I've, I've, I've had a buzz cut before. And I don't know what I'm going to do now. I'll figure it out. All right. Um, you so, closer to joining the club. Yeah, right. So I was, I was also, I've, I've plugged two drains in the last year. So I'm getting ahead of the curve. Um, all right. Back to what we're thinking about, right? Uh, Macintosh and Vermont are absolutely linked as far as the Apple world goes. So far as to Macintosh Apple being the state fruit of Vermont declared just about 20 years ago. Um, you know, that's not, that, that's not something to just kind of forget about. Um, that's not a Macintosh, by the way. Um, that's okay, that's okay. Um, so the, the, the conditions required to grow a proper Macintosh exist here. They've changed a little bit, certainly in the last uh, 20 years or so, where our falls, and many of us know that, that September is the new August, or October is the new September, and so those cool nights that ripen Macintosh are, and maybe I'm, I'm gonna guess there's a few nods around here, making it maybe a little bit more challenging to get the red color with the cool nights <laughs> are required. Uh, but still, this fruit is uniquely suited for this particular region. Um, but, you know, I was looking around at a few different uh, pieces, and I'll, when I post this, all these links will be live if you want to look at all the various things I've been reading about both the, the, the rise and the fall of our industry. Um, BBC News report, right? There's no Macintosh grown in England. Uh, we're highlighting, uh, about, which was this, five years ago, six years ago, um, the market change in the marketplace of the Macintosh apple. Uh, fewer people growing it, fewer, fewer uh, um, uh, customers buying it, you know, a real change in the in how things came about. Um, Macintosh, of course, the, the original Macintosh farm in, in Dundee, Ontario, famously, I don't know if it ever did sell, but was famously for sale for the first time outside of the of the Macintosh family. Uh, and this made another national uh, news story. But I thought the interesting thing that the image, I kind of moved through this video until I saw that, yeah, it's actually kind of running on the side while I was doing other things. What do I? What, what do you see there in that in that screen cap I made of the video? It might be hard to see from over there. Like the, the fight to save the Macintosh. It's a it's a headstone, right? And I just thought that that was kind of an interesting uh, visual that, that sort of popped up. I don't want to highlight. Maybe I should put a baby in there or something coming up because um, we are gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at some of these trends. Um, I don't think it's all. We're not, we're not totally in the grave. Um, but one of the, you know, initially when I first thought about this, maybe four or five months ago, whenever we start planning this particular uh, uh, meeting, I think Jim was the first one to ask me, like, what do we grow now that Mac and like, what's the next, what's the next thing we should grow? And, and this work was being done. When I was an undergrad, we were working on the NE 183 variety trial project, and Elena Garcia used to present at this meeting, the slides of the new varieties and Delblush, and some of these that came, I think Delblush is there, nobody knows that except me, but Honeycrisp was in this planting. Uh, Pinova, which is a fairly popular uh, apple on the west coast, it was in there. Ambrosia was in there. So there was a time when universities were looking at the next variety, when uh, universities were kind of publicly breeding and releasing these new varieties in a way that we could all access it. That's a little bit different from now. Uh, because we had this club phenomenon, this idea that came about right after Honeycrisp. Um, Honeycrisp basically paid for the University of Minnesota breeding program many times over. Uh, and meanwhile, in New Zealand, uh, where they had all of their extension, or what, what they called extension support, removed back in the 80s, early 90s, 
uh, if you think is bad here, it was eliminated, uh, and therefore they had to become much more entrepreneurial. And this idea of breeding apples and keeping them into closed clubs so you could keep the supply low and the price high emerged in New Zealand. And now it's the new normal in the US, to the point where this, this apple trial has not continued since the 1999 planting. Uh, it limped along for a couple years. Um, Ian Merwin from Cornell was interested, well, maybe we can look backwards and, and put wealthy and greening and put them head to head and see if we can uh, evaluate them. And, and it never really went anywhere because the, the wholesale marketplace, and as, as Russell mentioned, the money, not ter in terms of necessarily growers making money, but the, 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 the machinery behind these systems where a private breeder will breed this apple, privately test it within their own orchards uh, or with certain cooperators that are very tightly locked down. Uh, when they find the one that works, they market the hell out of it with lots of money, um, closed system, few growers, um, high level of um, uh, you know, marketing behind it. There's a lot of money tied up in the system and it's hard for us to break into it. And to my knowledge, I don't think there's a single grower in Vermont that's growing a club apple. Um, there's a few of us that got a few ambrosia trees because there's a couple years. Did anybody have any ambrosia? There was a couple years when it was on the market and then they trademarked and kind of closed it back in. So you can't find them anymore. Uh, Pinova is another one that's, that's sort of out there, but no one's in here. You look across the lake, uh, there are acres and acres and acres of ruby frost and snapdragon that we don't have access to. Um, does that matter? I don't know. Um, as Retail growers, I would say not really. Um, as wholesale growers, that shit definitely changes the landscape. Um, but I think there's as much risk in growing these high value, high risk apples uh, as there is in growing arguably lower value uh, fruit, that, but that market themselves, that don't require this whole machinery. Cosmic Crisp. Who's trying a Cosmic Crisp? Really? Admit it, come on. Two people? Are you kidding me? This is the first time that I've seen an Apple release that has been in the popular consciousness where, where people who don't even know that I'm in the Apple world say, hey, have you seen this new thing? I mean, this was the, the, the splash was made December 1st, 2019. This hit the market. They were everywhere. Uh, and the amount, the, the, the sheer amount of trees and acreage that, that Washington State, which has exclusive rights on this for 10 years, uh, put into this is staggering. And you're absolutely right, Russell. This is, a, this is something to contend with because Washington has too much at stake to lose, to, to allow themselves to easily lose. Now, what is Washington uh, uh, responding to? The decline of the Red Delicious, which is their Macintosh, but a worse apple, of course. Um, and that's, I mean, it's not just me saying that. Consumers have been saying that for a long time. Um, so they really were at a point um, more acute than this industry has, more acute than the Vermont dairy industry has, where they were looking at their, their markets going down the toilet and said, we need to you know, have a game changer. And that's Cosmic Crisp. Um, you're gonna get, has anybody had anybody ask at a pick your own this year? Probably at least a dozen times this year I had people come up to me asking about that. Wait till next year, because they're on the market, they weren't on the market yet. So the, they were just seeing the kind of pre-release hype. Um, so we're gonna to need to answer this. And so the answer is, well, no, but try Honeycrisp, try Wealthy, try whatever, but steer people to, to, uh, you know, to, to the local fruit and, and highlight the flavor. I think that's an important thing because it's a good apple, it's not a great apple. Um, there's not many great apples, frankly. Apples are, there's a, we eat lots of apples and, and I don't know, I eat hundreds a year. Uh, none of the angels don't come from the sky every time I eat one. And that's almost what you need for a $4 apple. Uh, of course, once you get hype, you get anti-hype. So, you know, one of the uh, Cosmos Crisp Apple is not the future. There was a taste panel in Salon uh, Magazine that uh, this was a blind taste panel, a bunch of New York journalists, uh, and uh, they declared, do you want to guess what their number one apple was that, on, on their taste panel? <coughs> what was it? There you go. No, no. No, yeah. Honeycrisp was kind of middling. Interesting. Macintosh wasn't even in the... Right, it was like five or six apples they tried. Gala? No, nah, Gala was in there and they said, you know what, Gala wasn't bad. They, it, they, they compared it favorably with a well-grown Gala. Um, no, it was Pink Lady, which of course we can't grow here. Um, so it was, you know, here's an apple which is also a club apple, trademarked club apple, um, that is kind of, I think, 
It's sort of passe, right? It's 20 years old. There's, there's, so the, the, my point here is that the gazillion dollar hype doesn't make an apple better, right? There's a good apple that was out there and people taste it and say, yeah, it's still a good apple. All right. I took this shot in the grocery store in uh, Montpelier, in Shaw's. Uh, well, it was after Cosmic Crisp was out, so it would have been after December 1st, right? Mid-December or so. What are we looking at? Three bucks a pound for, uh, what the heck are those? I can't realize. Sweet, those are sweet tangos. These honeybees, anybody seen these honeybee apples? There's also Kiku apples. Um, and they, there's just so many. And then, of course, Cosmic Crisp. Three, four bucks a pound, right? What are we getting? Like we're just stuck in the corner, and these are galas. They didn't even have Max on the on the counter. But uh, that is huge. Like that is kicking our ass um, from a wholesale standpoint. Uh, no, I won't even say that. From a grocery store retail standpoint, I'll say because how many, how much volume of these four dollar uh, apples are are going to move? Cosmic Crisp, I think, is around because it's you know it 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 has that power behind it. But this honeybee. I don't know. I mean, it's a handful of growers in Minnesota uh, who are promoting it, and I suspect that it's going to be like a jazz. When's the last time someone ate a jazz? Right? That was a hot one about eight years ago. It was a $3 apple. It's already falling by the wayside. To where, uh, you know, the industry is saying, we've got too many of these things. Like, the, con the consumer's only going to eat, it, hopefully, an apple a day. Um, can we keep throwing more and more $4 apples at them and tripping over ourselves with these? Um, but the problem is there's only so many slots in the grocery store. And those slots used to have, you know, Macintosh, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, Granny Smith, bananas and oranges, right? <laughs> um, and now we've got, you know, produce sections that are the size that the store used to be. Uh, but we've got star fruit and we've got kiwis and we've got those little uh, kumquat things and, and uh, the, the um, what is it? I'm thinking of the little oranges that, that my kid eats. Tangelos. Okay. Tangelos. But there's a name for it. There's cuties. Cuties. That's what I was looking for. Right? Uh, and so the industry, from the packing side, is often saying, you know what? These standbys are taking up space for higher retail varieties. Right? That $4 apple grocery store is making arguably more money off that $4 apple. So there's some concern. Yeah, these things are just churning out, uh, um, you know, like I say, jazz has already been knocked aside. Um, but are they pushing aside standbys where we have orchards that have been, who's got the oldest, who has a guess who has the oldest producing Mac tree in the room? Throw out a name, throw out a, a date for. We got them from 1940. 1940, and we got it older than 1940, older than 80 years old, right? How many jazz trees are gonna be in the ground in 80 years of the same tree, right? We'll talk about that in a second. So, this was done when, when Steve Justice did an a industry survey. It's going on 10 years ago. I don't think this has changed a whole lot. I have a pretty good idea of, of who's planting what. Um, we are fairly slow to replant in Vermont. If anything, we're pulling and not replanting. Um, but anything that's green is either Macintosh, which is about half of it, uh, or a child of Macintosh, Cortland, Spartan, Empire, whatnot. We are heavily, heavily still invested in Mac, and even, even if this has changed a little bit, we are well over 60% Mac. And I would say, say we're probably still three quarters percent Mac and Mac family. We are in this thing just as much as uh, Washington is in on Cosmic Crisp. We just don't have all that extra cost, you know, the $25,000, $30,000 per acre for all these new trees. But we are very heavily invested in this. Um, what do I want to cover with that? Well, I just want to say this is the corner we're marketing. Anybody read this story that made that, that came around this week, right? Oh, I think you, you shared it too. Um, I thought there was a lot of parallel here. Um, I don't know how many of you knew I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, and I teach, you know, I teach a lot of students now. I teach a lot of undergrad classes. And one of the things I tell, I always give stu students my origin story, I call it. Like, you know, where, where's this guy you're going to spend three months? Where did I come from? And I mentioned I came from a farm that... The current economic conditions left behind 20 years ago, right? 50 heads, you know, conventional tie stall dairy barn. Uh, and the similarities I saw in this article, which really looking, there's, there's, read this, so I'm going to send all these links to you guys. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities to think about, and it's already come up once this morning. I, oh, Allison mentioned it, the comparison to the dairy industry. But I'm going to make a little bit of a different comparison. It's not that. 
okay, the dairy industry is having some troubles, but the dairy industry also has um, some real opportunities ahead of it. And so that's where we're going to go. But I was looking at some commentary from a friend of mine about this article, and the, 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 the crux of the article is, uh, you know, dairy market's terrible, we are tripping over ourselves to, for a handful of farms to get larger to try to chase a declining dollar, uh, and they're just losing more money every gallon of milk they produce, uh, and we're kind of they're cornered in this pipeline um, that's going to be a failure. And then there's, I won't talk about the second half, the second half is like some of the, the bright spots. Um, but something that I thought was very interesting was the comment that nothing stays the same forever and diversity is always the best buffer against change. And that's one of the uh, bright spots we have as retail growers um, is the ability to plant other things that you aren't going to be able to market to the grocery store. Um, we're not going to get that 1.3 million bushel you know, wholesale market back, um, but we can provide other things to, to consumers. And it might not just be the app. Right? I mean, I don't. I was just talking yesterday about a grower who's now out of business, but down in New Hampshire, who used to, when he had his auction, you might remember, know this one, uh, High Hopes Orchard. Mm -hmm. And when he had his auction, I was looking at the, the auction, they had a choo-choo train there and like merry-go-round rides. Like that was his way of diversifying, was, was the experience. And it was, you guys don't want to get in the amusement park business, amusement park business. You're kind of in it a little bit if you're a pick your own orchard in Vermont. Uh, but that's some of that diversity we have, is, is marketing differently, diversifying our marketing. So another piece that we think about um, that to, to frame where Vermont sits, right? This is the Vermont apple tree. That's probably one of those 19, not one of yours, but it's similar era, 1940s or so. Um, M111, you know, the thing's 22 feet tall, picked with big ladders. And as we know, you know, modern orchard systems are changing, right? Um, very expensive. Are these? Is this your trees, Jim? I think these are. There's one of your little short rows from the yeah. from the test. Uh, but you know, we're moving to picking platforms. We have picking platforms in Vermont now. So high tech, high dollar in, high dollar out. You know, we're we're kind of playing with that, but not on the scale that they are just across the lake. So we're not really modernizing, and I'm not going to necessarily say that's a bad thing. Um, you know, the the industry is talking about. How small do you make your trees? Not do you make them small or not. Not do you tie them on wires or not. It's how intensive do we get? Are we planting our trees one feet by 10 feet or three feet by 12 feet? Um, and we're not. So this is from that 2011. I know things have changed a little bit since then. But what was interesting was 6% uh, of our plantings were standard trees, 1940s trees, right, at that time. I imagine a few of those have been cut down. Um, but very, very few of them, and I don't remember what the, what the actual slice was, um, single pole supported, uh, oh, Charles trees made 12% of our planting. So an eighth of our orchards were what we would consider modern orchard systems. And actually, if you look at the data, the questions that were asked, this is, tree, this is orchards that were 600 trees per acre or higher. And 600 trees per acre is a low density orchard nowadays. My point is, we grow old varieties and we grow big trees, right? I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I haven't, I've got this thesis in my head and somewhere if I get it, the funding to do this, um, I, I, I have a hypothesis in my head, but I really think that, they, that the way that our orchards are set up, if we grow that variety and we can sell that variety, our orchards are more resilient to the stressors that we're seeing. Um, you know, here's a good example. This was uh, fall of 2015, high density orchard at the Hort Farm, little skinny dwarf trees on wires, um, all this browning, are we going to guess for what that is? That's acute drought stress. So we went into um, Labor Day weekend, nobody was around, everyone knows our soil, it's pure sand. Um, we went into Labor Day weekend, it hit 90 degrees that weekend, nobody was around, you know, we actually took some time off, we're not a pick your own, so we don't open then. Um, turned out that this hadn't been watered for 10 days beforehand. These trees just said, all right, I'm, we're done. Um, amazingly, we didn't lose any trees, but they defoliated that year uh, because we couldn't spoon feed them as these new systems need to be spoon fed. Same tree, semi-dwarf, M7, or same orchard, I mean, you know, on the farm. Water wasn't turned on, same weekend, that's a gorgeous crop of fruit. Um, so I do think that there is some, there's something to the notion that, yes, these things take more time to prune, yes, they take more time to pick, um, but there's more resilience in the system that we're not constantly worrying about um, 
And I did the talk here a few years ago about trunk borers, and I did the math and figured out how much uh, um, vulnerable trunk area there was in a traditional freestanding orchard versus a tall spindle orchard, and it was like four times more vulnerable trunk area to get hit by voles, borers, mowers, whatever it might be. Um, so I'm not convinced, and I, I can't say this in the room with Terrence Robinson, he, he chews me out about it, but I do have one of the guys from Washington State who's um, just as much into tall spindle systems as Terrence who says, you know, there might be something to I'm hoping we can write a paper together because there's something to this. So, you know, Russell mentioned 1998. Was that the, the summit that we, that we had or was that just the, the, the usual annual meeting? If some of you remember, in 1998, the industry had a summit, a, uh, you know, this industry is having a tough time and the agency, the, the, the agency of ag got some money and we had, a, a, we had a, a, one of these kind of sessions, like what are we gonna do with this industry? We did that again. Um, Russell's right there, he's, he's in, you're in the picture here, I saw. Um, many of you, you were there, you were there. Many of us were here. Um, and this, this strategic plan got written up. Um, and actually, if you look through the, uh, the recommendations, many of those things are happening. Um, some of the cash support that was dry then is still dry now. You know, you can't make money out of nothing in terms of UVM extension, the agency of ag, you know, a lot of these groups this was at a time when, when, when the, uh, the, the funding was starting to reduce and it hasn't gotten much better, but if you look at what growers are doing and what we at UVM are doing, what the tree fruit growers are doing, we're keeping up our side of the plan. Um, so fast forward to this recent plan, and I just double checked, I thought I sent this to you folks in the email list, I haven't, so I'm gonna send this before the end of the day. The Farm to Plate uh, project, and Eric, I'm gonna give you a plug in a second. Um, the Farm to Plate uh, project was um, funded by the legislature 10 years ago-ish, right? That, I'm gonna ask you for the question, Erica. Sure. Sure, well you were executive, no, you were, no, what was your role, your title? Uh, I was the Farm to Plate director, but it was um, 2009 was the legislation. That's what it was. Okay, I'm gonna introduce you in a second. You, you show up here in, in a minute. I just wanted to check my date. Um, the, so the Farm to Play Strategic Plan was a um, specific act of the legislature to uh, basically have some direction about how we uh, support agriculture in Vermont. And so there was a first draft, which was very visionary, and now we just barely had the first of a two-part uh, section come out. Um, that's kind of like a snapshot of where have we gone, right? Um, there, I just did a control F on the plan. Apples the, specifically show up 30 times in that, in that plan. Um, so there, we are on uh, the radar of, of you know, the support system. So here's a shot. I don't expect you to be able to see that from there, but this is a shot. I wrote this. The uh, Vermont Tree Fruit Growers Board uh, are contributing authors. Our names are, are on that. We were, we were required to sign off and say we agree with this is our statement. Um, and what I wanted to highlight, so we had to give a few graphs, and this is one key piece, uh, some data pieces. We got half the orchard acreage that we had in 1997. We got half the orchard production that we had in 1962. Um, that's real, that, that's real data, and that's, that's something that uh, I wanted to highlight. But our prices are you know, two to three times higher. Now, one of the things about this is um, these are individually reported prices. So if you're a pick your own grower and you're getting 30, the equivalent of 30 bucks a bushel, then you've got 10 of them that report, they might produce all told between them, let's say 100,000 bushels between all 10 growers. You might have one 100,000 bushel grower who's getting, who's, I don't know if I, I won't make anybody say how bad the prices are right now, who's getting 16 bucks. Um, and those other nine would outweigh it. So this, this data is a little bit skewed, but the key point is um, prices are going up, particularly at the retail level. So, you know, are they, are they playing out? Uh, are they evening out? Not uh, as far as, do I mention this in here? The, uh, so these are my words, your words as well, because you guys, some of you signed this. Um, the local sales are not replacing all that wholesale uh, that, that we're losing. Um, and I don't expect they're going to, but um, we are seeing um, substantial increase across the state and a steady increase in retail orchard. Um, I did, so when I first set this out, there was one grower in particular who was like, you know, tell it like it is. Like you really need to like highlight that, that for the wholesale market, things are really tough. 
Um, so I kind of strengthened the language a little bit, and, and that actually, uh, what do I want to say, that got some attention. So I've seen some press, some post press about that, and the apples often are getting highlighted um, as a piece of this larger 100, 200, 200, 200 page document. Um, apples are one of the ones that are being highlighted even before dairy. Uh, say something nice, right? So we do highlight uh, some of the opportunities, particularly around retail, uh, direct store delivery, you know, that, that more human side of the market. Um, putting the apples on a truck, we will always have growers, I hope, in Vermont that are going to put apples on a truck and send them down the road and get a check. Um, and, but that's not where we're going to specialize. Just like that's the market where we're seeing like our milk uh, decreasing. Um, so that's tricky. But there are increases in uh, activity. I look at UVM. UVM is buying 100% Vermont apples for 10 plus years now. Uh, and that's a huge buyer. There are other institutional buyers that are recognizing. And, and the Farm to Plate network and the Farm to Plate uh, initiative is helping to kind of put those people together to ensure that uh, at least the bellies that we feed in Vermont are getting fed with Vermont produce. Um, so there is a real um, movement in that uh, regard. I'll let you read this, it's really small, but we did give some very specific recommendations. Some of them say, you know, will require funding, which may require either federal money, state money, legislative approval. So this is, you know, big asks. Uh, and um, I don't know. We'll we'll see what comes from that. These this report goes to the legislat the Vermont legislature, uh, and then they're they're probably going to make some some moves on it. We're going to jump off of that for a minute because we do have people that are in our corner, even though it may not seem it. Um, so I want to highlight. You know, Allison Eastman always comes to this meeting. You know, when when she's around more uh, more recently. Um, makes a point to come here uh, you know, from uh, Montpelier. But I highlight a few other people, you know, the agency. I see Anson Tebbets, I think, you know, Anson's everywhere, right? Uh, and I see him, I don't know, seems like four times a semester anyway, just in passing. Um, he's been a real uh, uh, friend of the industry, I would say. Abby Willard is one of the marketing people who I bumped into at coffee. She's like, that Apple thing, like, you're onto something. Uh, so people know about this. I also want to highlight, and Eric and I will give you a quick uh, uh, introduction, um, our congressional delegation, and I'm not going to say the pipeline of money is going to come pouring from Washington, but our uh, congressional delegation knows about this industry. Um, Tom, oh sorry, Tom Barry, sorry. Um, Tom Barry, and I don't think he's here now, Tom was planning on coming today, um, works for Senator Leahy's office, Ryan McLaren works for Representative Welch's office, and Erica Campbell, you want to give a quick Two second intro, two minute, whatever you want. Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Eric Campbell. I work with Senator Sanders um, the last three years on national policy. Um, this is my first meeting here as a uh, um Was with Partners Place Force. I did a lot of the more local food systems development stuff. Um, you know, the congressional delegation is obviously really supportive of agriculture in Vermont, is facing a lot of challenges. Um, Senator Leahy is on the Ag Committee as well as Appropriations, so we're really well situated. Um, from Senator Sanders' angle, I will just say like things that he's really concerned about. Um, obviously, the impacts of agriculture on rural communities, um, you know, but also this intersection with um, the environment and climate change, and we're really interested in you know, how all industries, including the apple industry, can play a really big role in some of that um, regenerative agriculture conversation. So I'd just love to hear more, too, about how the apple industry and um, tree fruit growers are sort of thinking about that conversation. And on the other side is sort of the health piece. Um, really, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And the intersection between food and health is becoming increasingly important and sort of thinking outside the box of uh, produce prescriptions and um, all these ways that ultimately we need to shift our healthcare system towards more preventative model. Um, and I think that like, this is a perfect um, produce, produce as well as um, apples and other tree fruits are really important part of our diet. So those are some things on our mind. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to say hi. And if you if you ever want to visit, 
Bernie loves when I go out on farms. He's always asking me where I visited and really wants me out there. And I know Tom and Ryan love to visit farms as well, so in orchards. So if you are interested in a visit, please let me know. Thank you. I totally put her on the spot, by the way. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I teach an agriculture policy class, and I highlight to the students um, how human our politics are in Vermont, how easy it is to, to have access. Um, and we have access. We have, and it's all also highlight uh, at UVM, even though it seems like, and I'm you know, a lifer there, uh, it seems like there's not a lot of support. They know we exist. They know that with the, we, and I say we as an industry, I include myself among you and us, um, with the pot that they have to work with, you know, they, are, they, they know that, that we're here. I'll just say that. Um, President, even our, our fairly new president, uh, Suresh Garamella, uh, before recent discussions had actually reached out to me uh, because he was interested in what fruit we grew and we provided him with some, some honey crisp from the farm and he, and he hasn't been out yet. Um, took, uh, what, what did it take for Mailey? Like two years to get out there. But most presidents make it out to our farm. Um, but he has already, from his side, exchange, you know, opened up the, the discussion about uh, the apple industry and really specifically about the land grant mission. He's very committed to that. Um, okay, and I want to absolutely highlight one thing that's, that's different in the last few years. Uh, you know, we used to have, you know, Mike Brinkman, I'm, I'm reusing my picture, your picture again. You see oh, you're up there? Up. Yeah, okay. you're back up. I didn't even um, know. You know, uh, Mike was fabulous, uh, you know, it, but the change when, uh, when, when Eric came on, I think it's about the time when the, when the concept of, you know, the pesticide salesman became the crop consultant, and I would even say more like the industry cheerleader, right? Uh, and that's not something to, uh, you know, just just cast aside and, and think, you know, Eric's just here to sell stuff. Um, so we have an absolute champion in the industry uh, to have that. So thank you, Eric. Boy, I wish my pictures were sharper here, but that's okay. Um, you know, I wanted to highlight, we've already mentioned some of the new faces here. Um, this is an orchard you can't tell here. Fabulous sunrise. This is very near my house. This is, uh, um, Oh, you know, I was just going to say Greg, but it's not Greg's. It's Dan Mayer's Orchard, Peck Farm in East Montpelier. Um, brand new, well, brand new, now it's five, six, seven years old. Um, but in the orchard world, that's, you know, a baby. We have a number of orchards. How many orchards are less than 10 years old? You're, okay, okay. How many are less than 15? Now 15 is starting to get there. Okay, so that's maybe 20% of the room. Um, that's something if we'd asked them a while ago, you know, it was rare to start. In, and I'll count you as new. You're a new, you're a new farmer, right? So um, we have new faces. We've been trying to reach out to new faces, and we're seeing, um, you know, an increase in in retail sales from these folks. Um, right down. Sorry, I guess again. Um, this is what two days ago this came out. Um, yesterday. Okay. See, I, I keep up on things. That's going to be a good shot. Uh, seven Days did a little photo essay on farming in the winter, um, and this was the one that hit their, the, the, the homepage at least, they, uh, which is a great shot of Jessica pruning uh, a tree. So the industry knows, the people know, the, the journalists know that we're out there. Um, so that's not a piece of goodwill to, to, to throw away. I'm going to touch a second on cider and then kind of jump on to other things. You know, there was a time when I came in here as, you know, new faculty, which was still old Terry, you know, in 2014. Like, this is a wave we're all going to ride and we're all going to plant these cider trees and we make all this money. Uh, and then, turns out, uh, it didn't happen, right? It sort of did, but it sort of didn't. And we don't know where things are at. But 2019, you know, we're seeing certain <coughs> brands, particularly national cider brands, having some Real challenges. I mean, this is the, the dairy market or the MAC market of, of cider. But regional cider brands are still showing um, single to double digit growth, right, <laughs> Ben? Um, and these are the people who are buying our fruit. They're not buying, they're buying some fruit at, at what I would say would be packing house, you know, dessert fruit prices, a certain amount of that. Um, and I think there's going to be some changes in the in the year coming up where there may be some buyers looking for other fruits. So keep your your, your ears out there. Um, but this is an area that we shouldn't ignore, um, and and certainly we're not ignoring. You've already seen me talk about some of the work we're we're going to be doing. This is a slow and steady growth, and now cider is a primary part of the apple industry. 
Oh, look at that. Copy it over. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight, so I looked at the 2018 Packer Fresh Trend Survey. So this is a survey of consumers nationwide from the Packer. You can imagine what they are. They're a wholesale, oriented to the wholesale produce market. Um, and they highlighted the Northeast had consumers at the highest likelihood to purchase apples. Uh, Macintosh, which they spelled wrong, uh, was still up in the top 10-ish, but still declining, but it still was up there. These new guys were in that, you know, 1% or less, because they're all fighting it out. They're all fighting it out for that maybe 10% market share that a $4 apple is going to get, $4 a pound of apple is going to get. Um, so let them fight it, right? If we just keep our nose to the ground, we pay attention to new varieties that we can grow, um, but we, we grow a high quality fruit and we market it, I think we can do all right. Um, all right, last thing I wanted to highlight. So um, the dig in already came up and I just was gonna highlight their orchard listing. This was their homepage uh, 15 minutes ago, right at the top and center. Um, so we do have people in the state who know we exist, who are marketing us. We're a very visual group. You know, we're a good looking group to make slides from. Uh, so it's an easy thing to, to market. Um, uh, Russell, I just took this shot to also highlight uh, your website. Um, this was a great blog piece that was written that, that really I think you summed it up. You know, there's a, there's a standard that New Englanders have that they know about Macintosh. Um, they recognize Macintosh and as long as we provide a quality Mac, there's still going to be a market for it. I think that's all I was going to say and that leaves us with a couple minutes to discuss. Maybe we can do it over lunch. Yeah, Russell. I have a question for you, but before I say that, just to your, one of your last points, I think as humans, we're hardwired to grow food, no matter how challenging it is. And when I started this in 1996, there was a lot of talk about the aging farmer, and I don't hear as much of that anymore, and I see all of these fabulous entrepreneurial models. I think that people are always going to find a way to do this and do it successfully, even though it's going to have to change. But my question for you, when those 10 or 12 customers asked for Cosmic Crisp, what did you say? I told them it's not Honey Crisp. <laughs> <laughs> You're being <laughs> lied to! And I would actually want to talk about a little bit about the politics of the Club Apple and how that came about because of Honey Crisp and kind of having heard Terry spiel for a couple of years now. Um, and um, I told them I haven't tried one. Um, but I, said, I, I still think that you know, Honey Crisp has legs, I think, you know, still to go. Um, my reason for asking is because, in my experience, I think sometimes we become overly <coughs> defensive. And I think it's okay to say, Macintosh is a great apple, Portland is a great apple. There's a reason it's been around here for a century. It's a great apple. And I think sometimes we go the other direction and say, well, no, we don't have it here. We can't grow it because it's club variety, which consumers don't care about. And so, this, is a, this isn't directed to you by yeah. any means, but it's a general comment. I think we need to be a little more assertive about how good our apples are. Great. Phil, do you want to take a couple of minutes to mention the, another initiative? It's the, kind of my time to talk about how we've got support. Um, so I... Um, did anybody go to the farm show this year, the Vermont Farm Show at the uh, fairgrounds? Yeah. So I was asked uh, by Eric to kind of look at this, and I talked to Glenn Rogers there, and I spent some time with him. So I'm going to represent the uh, Tree Fruit Growers Association at the Vermont Farm Show board. They meet twice a year. Um, I haven't been to one yet. They meet in May. Um, but my question, first of all, was to let you guys know that, you know, through Eric and through Terry, funnel up anything that you might have for to make that farm show uh, effective for this organization. Uh, right now, the way I looked at it, and I, you know, I, I go to it, you know, I, used to, I grew up in Barrie, so I used to be in Barrie, and I used to go there as a kid, and it was more, and it's morphed, you know, it was all dairy, you know, 90% dairy, you know, for, for, the, for many, many years, and then with the decline of dairy, it's the farm show has gotten more, a little more diverse, but it's still <coughs> dairy-centric, the way I see it. Um, there's certainly room in there you know, we have no representation there at this point for, you know, there's, you know, I went there to even see if there was, you know, last year I was there and there was a guy, there was people selling drainage, uh, you know, options and fencing. This year, no drainage and one person for fencing. Um, you know, they used to have, uh, I know there used to be more um, trade there that represented our organization with uh, pruning and, 
and different equipment, but um, you don't even see that there. Um, you know, they don't, I, I think that's a, it's a, it's, the farm show is, it's, it's kind of muddling along. It's not, um, there's no great, there's not great crowds there. They have a steady crowd, um, if you could call it a crowd. It's, um, there's some available, booths available. You know, they still have some space available to sell. Uh, the booths are pretty inexpensive. They're 360 bucks for a booth space. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is, is what I want to hear from this organization before I go, you know, as I represented at the board is, you know, what do we want? Do we want to participate more? Um, I think there's an opening there because of the fact that they're still, they're, they're, they're in an identity crisis a little bit as far as the way I saw it from what I just, my, my quick observation is, is what, um, I, I think there's an opportunity there for this organization to become, you know, to get some type of a footprint there and then maybe, you know, uh, get the um, uh, farm show to maybe increase their foot traffic. They don't even know right now, because I, I asked the question, I said, how many people do you get here? They have no clue. They don't count. They don't count numbers walking through the door. Um, so I, I would say it's in several thousand, but I don't know how many thousands uh, people come there over the three days. Um, but I guess the way I look at it, without having put a lot of an analysis into it at this point, is there's an opportunity, I think. If we as an organization wanted to create some energy, uh, promote our, promote our, uh, you know, our craft and, um, and it's either that or it just continues to muddle along and, and um, you know, something, it's a free entry to the event um, and I, I, see, I see a need there for, for it to morph into something more than it is because it's kind of flatlining the way I, I think. Um, so if you've got ideas and you want to, you know, put some energy into it, um, funnel it up through these guys and they'll get it to me and and um, I don't have any necessarily any great ideas other than I, I think there's an opportunity there um, to increase overall. I mean, I've seen this room over the 20 years I've been involved in this. I've seen this room change. Um, in, and, uh, you know, and I think that the farm show needs to kind of change with, with uh, what Vermont farming is all about nowadays. And it's not all, obviously, all dairy. Good. Thank you. So. so Phil Murdoch, uh, Chapin Orchard, should highlight that. Uh, farm show is put on by the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, so it's intended to represent all of Vermont agriculture. And tree fruit growers have not ever, then, to my knowledge, had a, a presence there. It's very consumer and public oriented. Um, I say it's free. People come in, and it's in January. There's no reason for us not to show up, right? There's nothing else we're doing. It's like, right? Okay. Um, okay. <coughs> Vendor. Okay, so I'm going to pause with that. We can talk over lunch. I think I'm, am I done on this afternoon? Oh, we're doing something this afternoon. Okay, so you're here for me later this afternoon. Um, but there's a very important piece that we've neglected for years. Years and, and years. Eric has brought it back. So thank you. Let's I, get this discussion going. I always try to go to 